he was just there. I mean, this this Matsyantar Prabhu and his team, they were about three, four very young men actually. I mean, they were all like our age or you know, even lesser than us actually. They were in their early thirties or late twenties. You know, Americans and Ah, he's from Australia. Yeah, so he showed this picture to somebody, yeah? Not all of them, some of them actually. Yeah, he's from Australia, yeah, he told us he's from Australia. So, you know, they are basically into translating books. So, they were telling us, you know, what are the challenges in it. So, first of all, they were saying, because, you know, when they said translating, I was wondering, you know, is there anything more to translate? You'd be very surprised to know, that Prabhupada's desire, it seems, was to translate 500 more books of the of the Acharyas. It, he was telling us that Jiva Goswami's books only, because Jiva Goswami has written books in which means original composition of Jiva Goswami is four lakh verses, Sanskrit verses. Four lakh Sanskrit verses is original composition. Uska purport. It's like unimaginable actually, the work that he has done. He was saying that just to do a Jeeva Goswami's work only, we will take 50 years or something. I mean, and that also many of us, if we are there. He is saying this is the work of many, many lifetimes and generations of devotees. He said. So we will start and you know, we will just end at some point. And then the next generation of devotees is supposed to take it up, take it ahead. Like this, over separate generations of devotees, Many of their works will be published. So they have published some of the books, like for example, the Sad Sandarbha they have started publishing. The first one they have published. And it's a big challenge to publish it. They were saying that translation of Vaishnava Acharya's books is very tough because they said you have to use traditional ways of doing it. That's what Prabhupada wanted. They were saying that the scholars who are there, they use this Monier Williams dictionary. There are some standard dictionary available, English to Sanskrit. They were saying these dictionaries are useless from the perspective of the Acharya's writings. From the Acharya's writing, you have to use dictionary like Amara Kosha dictionary. Amara Kosha literally means every word has unlimited meanings. That is what Amara Kosha means. So that is the beauty of Sanskrit language. One word does not have one meaning. One word has unlimited meanings. And in all the context, you have to see the meaning. You understood? So, they were saying that, you know, reading a tika, especially reading, first of all, there are verses of these acharyas, and then there are their tikas or commentaries. Like, for example, all these people, you know, they have their Bhagavad commentary in Sanskrit. And they were saying, reading their tika is very, very difficult. He's saying that, first of all, you know, to learn that Sanskrit takes so many years, you know, and then also, you know, he's like reading like their commentaries is like reading someone's notes. He's saying if you're reading someone's notes, you have to read in between their lines. So he's saying, for example, Jiva Goswami, very casually in the middle of some writing, he will say that, you know, this is according to Drishti Srishtivad. So you know, Drishti Srishtivad is one branch of Mayavad, so which no one knows. So you have to understand what he's talking about. And then only you can interpret that sentence. Think for one month sentence only, they will take uh, you know several months of research to find out you know what they are meaning actually in the context. Yeah. So, but they were saying that Prabhupada wanted it to be done in a very good way. So they they showed many of their books. I have a couple of them at Bhargis as well. So, like for example, the Bharat Bhagavatam is done by the BBT. See, one thing I understood is that the BBT, the quality of books that they bring out now, it's much different from anything else. So that's why even when that's why, like for example, Bhunath Bhagavatam Vrita, which Gopi Pranadhan Prabhu has got out three volumes. It's a masterpiece. Masterpiece as in, you know, like, all the Western scholars are saying that this kind of a book, this Bhunath Bhagavatam Vrita, which he got out, the whole uh, 2800 verses were in Sanskrit, Sanatana Goswami's composition, and all the purports were in Sanskrit. And everything has been made into English in the perfect manner. Means like there are there, what they do is BBT when they print any such book, they give it to critics in America you know, who are like real Sanskrit scholars. They say find mistakes in this. And they study the whole thing very critically. I mean they are not devotee quote unquote, you know, they are like Western scholars who like who have mastered Sanskrit, who are dogs in that field. 
They study everything and they say, you know, they say, yeah, this is like really good, materially well done. Because Prabhupada wanted books like that, which are perfect from the scholarly perspective also. I mean, nobody can point a word saying that what a lousy publication this is. So you're saying that most often what happens is, like many other, you know, other than non-BBT books which are there, they just cut down things. That means, for example, they were saying like Bhakti Ratnakar, it's available today, somewhere in Lohi Bazaar if you go. But it's a cut down version, where there are many hundreds of verses in the middle, they have just chopped it, because they don't know the meaning of it only, the translation. So, Hari Bhari me phata phata print kar diye, laga del se ilke liye. So, people buy it also. So, itna to samaj gaya humko, bas. Okay, it may have its own relevance, but Prabhupada did not want the BBT to do it that way. And, and he was saying that for any book to be published, it's not just the book, the front and back portions are the more important. That means, for example, to give an entire, you know, bibliography and to give, uh, you know, all these references, you know, like they give, na, A to Z, keywords, you say anything, you can find it in the book. And, you know, organizing all the verses into chapters and, you know, so many things. The front and back portion only takes a phenomenal time for them. So they were, they were sharing with us, actually, there were about five of them. They were sharing with us how much time they put into, how much effort this, they have been putting to get one book out. But they are saying that they are very happy that even if they get one book in five years. Because it takes that much time for them to, you know, study everything to get something out for the Vaishnava community. Because they want something permanently done. That means they, they, they want to do it, BBT, they are saying their goal is, you know, to publish books in such a way that in future nobody will have to ever worry, you know, how to. No I mean, uh, you don't have to go over it again. Uh, no, no, no edition. Once done, finished. Done perfectly. So it was it was very wonderful actually to meet such people, you know, who are you know who who have given their life for this purpose. You know, studying all these things, studying Sanskrit and studying all these books and you know bringing out in a very scholarly fashion. It just adds to the, you know, the general, you know, the, the richness of our, you know, Eastern culture and everything. Of course, most of us, we have our own challenges just to complete proper books, basic, you know, I mean, in our lifetime. But, you know, so they are addressing a bunch, uh, you know, kind of an audience, you know, for whom that is, you know, very easily accomplished already. <laughs> Whatever. So, they were saying actually how difficult it is to make a purport. So there is one there is one verse of one of these people on the Acharya Sandhu, which says that how a purport means you should know where to break the words, what every word means in a sentence, where the compounds break, what function the word has in the sentence, and resolve all doubts that arise from the verse. When these five things are complete, then your translation and purport to a verse is complete. So, Padachet padatokni vikraha vakya yojanam akshepeshu samadhanam panchamam dalalakshanam. So, this is a verse that describes how to compose purports. So, they are going according to all these things, ensuring that the purport to everything they do is actually happening. So, in the Shad Sandarbha of Jiva Goswami, they have started that. So, the first one they got out, Tattva Sandarbha. And slowly they are going to get all the six out. And they are classic actually, if you will just you know, look into the kind of material that is actually there within Jiva Goswami's writings. So that's the Tattva Sandarbha and Jiva Goswami's commentary of Srimad Bhagavata. Organized thematically. You know, means not verse by verse. Organized thematically. In different themes. He has broken it and he has, you know. I mean, just, even if you just look at it, just like we saw today, you know, you are just struck in, struck with awe actually. You know, to look at the kind of scholarship that is actually there. From this, we can begin to understand what scholarship was in those days. You know, like if you reflect back and see in Chaitanya Chaitanya Amrita, where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is meeting Keshav Kashmiri and asking him to recite verses on the Ganga, and he's just saying hundreds, you know, immediately composing. And Mahaprabhu is just picking one of it out, reciting it, and finding five faults and five good qualities and sending him back. You can, you can just imagine, you know, the kind of scholarly level which was there. You know, like we've seen Chaitanya Bhagavata, where it is repeatedly been said, there are the Mishras and the Chakravartis and the Bhatta, Bhattachari, Bhattacharyas and you know, all these big, big scholars who will be sitting in Bengal and you know, churning out all these verses and 
getting out so many things. You can just imagine the kind of scholarship that existed in India. I said, nowadays, if you see, you know, there is that scholarship does not exist anywhere actually. You know, it's very gross. Our modern education and everything is, you know, there is a very gross level. It's, you know, this kind of subtlety and beauty and elegance, there's no question of it. Yeah. But these people can say that today's uh, scholarship is more appealing to many people. This is like you, you pundit you sit and discuss, not for everyone to pass it now. In a way, even today is like that only. Most people, what they say, most of the scientists, what they say, don't understand the way. Even the Germans' papers that they write it, or who understands? <laughs> we quote it without understanding it. <laughs> right, now. We understand what they, everybody says. <laughs> that applies everywhere, actually. It is just that the modern scholarship is more in relation to, you know, some different, different products to keep getting for sense enjoyment. <laughs> That was never treated as scholarship from their perspective. I mean, the whole vision was different. So it, it's it's kind of surprising to see that such people actually. So you know, so so in such a culture, such people thrived. You know, they came out of that culture. Like Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, material. I mean, of course, from a very spiritual level, if you see, I mean, they came from the spiritual world. From but from a social level, if you see, they came out from such a background, right? where there were such pundits in existence. So that's why these kind of people thrived and they came out with such a contribution of books and work. Otherwise, it's not possible. Yeah. Another thing they spoke to us, the BBT spoke to us, was about editing Prabhupada's books. You know, when this kind of more ground-to-earth topic, where they were talking to us about, you know, why they had to edit it. And why, you know, there is, I mean, so much of uh, fuss and you know, so many things have been created by especially all these earthquakes and many people. Actually, phone and all, we don't even know these things. We don't, none of us are even into all this. But if you go anywhere outside here and there, you will see people talking about all these things. Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, you are not busy, you are not happy in Krishna consciousness. Some fault you have to keep finding. So, you know, they keep finding fault with people like Jayadeva Swami and others who have actually edited the books. Now, the basic background is that Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita was published. You know, I mean, this version 1972, the first one. And then after Prabhupada left, they decided to edit the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> In a way, it became a little controversial because, you know, how do you edit a book after the author has already passed away? You understand? You understood, na? Author has already passed away. He's already gone back. You know, and now you are taking the book and editing it. But the thing is, there were too many problems in it. You know, that's... I mean... Just to give us some examples, like, like in one of the verses of Bhagavad Gita, it comes Pitru Loka. So Pitru Loka was translated in the first edition until 1983 as the planet of trees. Pitru, pit tree, pit tree Loka, tree Loka. So the Haigiro Prabhu and the other editors who split the word, split it as P separately with the previous word and then tree and Loka. <coughs> And in the translation of the Bhagavad Gita, it was Pitra Loka, planet of trees. So among the planet of trees, I am Aryama. You know, Krishna is saying, I am Aryama among the Pitris. So anybody in India understands what is Pitra Loka? Because Pitra Loka is a very standard terminology used in the Indian context. The basic whole, the whole challenge was that Prabhupada, you know, dictated on the dictaphone. And then his authors were transcribed. And, and, and the people who trans, I mean, the people, devotees who transcribe, they were not seasoned people. They were Americans who had just come and, you know, bumped in the temple for the last two weeks. To seva de, they were like, chalo, suno. So, usko chunai ni de, they were like, pitri, tree, 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 they were loka, they were loka, they were loka, they were loka, pitri, loka. So, planet of trees, for it all, they were going to tell. And Prabhupada never, you know, I mean, there was no such system, there was no time. It was all like, you know, it was an emergency. Emergency dharma preaching. So it was not that Prabhupada would translate, I mean, give the dictaphone and they would translate, come back to Prabhupada, Prabhupada would edit and check it. No, it just went out and went in the book and it hit the street, that's it. It was sold, <laughs> you understood. And it paid devotees also. <laughs> so in 1985, that Bhagavad Gita was only there. In 1985, it was a phenomenal, if you see. So in 1985, the new edition of Bhagavad Gita came out. Where they, you know, did this. Or for example, in the 18th chapter, Goraksha. Goraksha is translated as cattle grazing. 
Cattle grazing is not Goraksha. Goraksha is cow protection. So what happens interestingly on that verse, so many times what has happened is many of these verses, Prabhupada gave lecture on those verses. When Prabhupada would give lecture, the servant Pradyumna would read the verse and Prabhupada would speak. So many of these wrong translations also, they would read and Prabhupada would speak and Prabhupada would not even point out. Because then Prabhupada was not sitting on the Vyasasana in the mood of a editor. That's what all these foolish people keep challenging nowadays. Prabhupada heard this verse of Pitra Loka, in that place he gave a lecture. Why he didn't object? That means he has accepted the translation. But Jayadat Maharaj is saying, it's not like that. When Prabhupada gave that class, he was in the mood of giving class. Not in the mood of correcting the mistakes of the book. He's not sitting with that hat. You understood? <coughs> so you know, you cannot imagine how hot this session was. This session was given by Dravida Prabhu. Dravida Prabhu is like, if any of you know who is Dravida Prabhu, he is the senior most Brahmachari in his He is like our Janimas Prabhu kind of person. And Prabhupada Chaim is a Brahmachari, Saffron. Amazing personality he is. Amazing. Sweet means sweet. Like his, his command over English and Sanskrit is phenomenal. You know, I mean, I had the opportunity to sit with him for lunch for two days. Oh my God, he just entertained us with so many verses of Rupa Goswami like this. I mean, different from all this, what we discussed. He knows all kinds of verses of Rupa Goswami. Everything. He just keeps saying, 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 you know. In different, different ragas, he knows verses, different melodies, and you know. He was going on saying verses and explaining the meaning to us. It was, it was so quick. You know, while this, you know, I and Bhagavan Prabhu were sitting with him for lunch. And he was like on and on and on with all his verses. In fact, I, I was just thinking I would have wanted to record it or something. There was no way, there was nothing. It was like a shower of nectar that just overpowered us. We were just laughing, that's all. When Nehil Prasad, ah, so that was the Dravid of Prabhu. So he is like the other Swami's right hand man for editing. He is the person who has done most of it. The session which he gave was so hot. My God, devotees all over the world. You know, for many people, these things are very touchy topics. For most of us here, we are very happy, you know, we are fine with it, we have understood. But for people across the world, leaders, it was not like that. It was like really war with them. People were asking, how long will this editing go on? Because they were saying, editing is, we are doing editing even now. They were saying, Dhiradapra was saying, it's an ongoing process. Even Bhagavatam. Everything. I mean, once a year, they, they, once a year, they get one mistake. They change it. You think, for example, recently they found in first canto, in one place it is written, Krishna affected material nature. But according to the English, it should be Krishna effected material nature. He gave us a long explanation for five minutes. Why affected is not suitable in this place, it should be effected. And then he said that Prabhupada told in the mic, all this thing. So what Prabhupada is saying, you can see it as affected also, effected also. So people are saying, so long it was affected for 40 years, now why effected? Because effected is the right word. We understood it now, so we are going to change it. So people were asking, how long are you going to change it Prabhuji? How long will this happen? Some people were really touching wood. He said, till I and Jesus Swami are alive, it will happen. Then we have made a will that after we die, nobody will touch any of the books. Means they are like making it in their constitution like that. So it's like, you know, they have that kind of a spirit towards you. So I mean, I saw the Ravada Prabhu in two different moods. One during lunch where he was laughing and everything and one in a super solid, serious mood where he was a strong defender of Prabhupada's books and he wanted that the proper book should have that kind of academic integrity and you know, and perfection everywhere. So they are looking for perfection now in very minute places like this. I said affected, affected, I said change karate. Change means not that, you know. You understood, no? Yeah, this is the subtlety. You understood? So like that, you know. So they were like, you know, I mean, in fact, they were, In fact, there was this most, this thing was this 4.34, Tadvidi Pranipati, 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 Pariprashani Sevya, there, it is like, you know, in the original Bhagavad Gita was something like, because he has seen the truth, but what now they have done is because they have seen the truth. You understood, na? So this became a whole Ritvik issue. Because for the Ritviks, Prabhupada meant he has seen the truth, because only Prabhupada has seen the truth. <laughs> Jnanina Stattva Darshinaha. So, initial translation it was singular. But these people are saying that the Sanskrit is saying in plural. Darshinaha. You know, any common person can understand it. 
See now what would happen is many times the translations na, which are there that were not given by Prabhupada only. Prabhupada told, I agree with Prabhupada, you find the right yourself to do it. My corpus and quoted. This is Prabhupada's statement. You understood? <laughs> so these people are thinking it is not like we are changing Prabhupada's words, we are changing Hegel or Prabhupada's words. The translation Prabhupada is given. Prabhupada did not give translation. No, some places he has, some places he has not given that also. But purport? Purport Prabhupada has given. Word meaning never? God, no, some places he has given that also. Like Peter Logan only has only given. That depends. First six chapters he has not given. Middle six he has given. Like that. In that also, there are many, many differences. In some, the recording is still available of Prabhupada. Some, the recording is lost, but the original transcription is available. But the original transcription was based on a recording which you heard. So there already one mistake happened. But there are many, many levels in it. So he was explaining in great detail. He had a PPT. We are not in God. We will be getting it very soon. The PPT. So we had a PPT which said, which chapter of Bhagavad Gita, at what level it is available now? So some chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the recording is not available. The first transcription is not available. Only the book is there. So there you cannot make many changes. Because you don't even know what Prabhupada said. Like in one place in 6th chapter, for example, Hayagriva Prabhu has put a sentence, what prophet does a man get, you know, who has loosed a soul or something like that. That actually Prabhupada said in one lecture, he told in conversation that this line I have not said only in the purport. Hayagriva Prabhu had added it by himself. Bible says sentence, open and say, okay, I'm telling. So he says some things like that you have not even touched it because you don't even know what Prabhupada said. Means officially because the transcription is not there. You understand? Huh? So some we are going according to common sense and logic like Pitri Loka. So you know what it is. So there is no need to argue only what Prabhupada said. Whether Prabhupada said planet of trees. Well, that's what Krishna meant. Aryama is the planet. Among all planet of trees I am Aryama. Is that what Krishna meant? You understood? So Darshinaha. So Darshinaha means they. You understood? So it's plural. So this change was like the most debated change among all these people. You know? So they were like defending it and you know, I mean, it's like for, for me personally, I mean the experience that I had on seeing that was like, you know, I was like really stunned to see that what kind of people, you know, by somehow Krishna's arrangement were there to protect Prabhupada's legacy. That's how I saw it. It's class. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, people of this kind of a caliber, you know, Jai Swami and Dravida Prabhu, they are the main people in this. Only two of them. Editors of Prabhupada. They were the English editors of Prabhupada's books since Prabhupada's times after Hagrid Prabhu. Because Hagrid Prabhu was the original editor, then he left in 1972. In 1973, Jared Swami becomes the editor. And then he's still there as editor. And Dravida Prabhu also. So these two people, see, sometimes what happens in Krishna consciousness, you know, we just don't even know to whom all we owe our debt for what we have. You know, I mean, we may think that, you know, we our debt is only to our immediate authorities or from whom we heard or no. You owe a debt to the whole body of Islam. Without which, you just don't know what kind of calamity would be going on now. You just don't even know what kind of contribution they have made in the books of Prabhupada's figure. Because Prabhupada is dictated. That's it. Then everything, first of all, it never happens like that. With no author does like this. This dictates and gives it off in the transcript and make a book. So, you know, you need such kind of high caliber people in the background who can do that kind of high caliber work and most importantly fight and defend with the devotees only that what they are doing is correct. Because that is the biggest challenge. Because they, their main so called, you know, opponents or, uh, you know, people who are arguing are not the outside people. They are not asking. Outside people are not asking. Hey, Peter Loka Kutum, the planet of Aryama, the planet of ancestors. So, devotees are asking. So to them to defend it strongly, that no, what we did is correct. How long will you do? We will do till we die. Why you will do? Prabhupada authorized to do it. They have letters on these things. Where Prabhupada authorized them to change his books. If they find any mistake and get it to the best standard. So they are committed to that task. You understood? So not that they are not shying away. You say anything you want. We are very clear about it. And they defend it like anything. I mean, they are like lions in that field. I mean, and, and sometimes they have to defend it even from, literally to say, the GBC, so to speak. Like for example, if you know, just two years back, the GBC, they passed, they, you know, if you know in ISKCON, you know, GBC and BBT are two separate entities. So these are BBT trustees. So the GBC wrote to the BBT that some letters, lines in Prabhupada's purport, which are a little bit controversial or something, you know, why don't you give a footnote and give an explanation? They suggested. 
like here two three example like in some place third kind of proper says you know a woman likes a man who is exported right so there is the sentence that comes so that actually jayadev swami he explains in the lecture what is the meaning of that so the meaning of that is not that a woman likes a man to publicly you know catch her in a park and you know do something what it means is a woman likes an aggressive man he, then he quotes romantic novels saying that the best romantic novels are those where the heroine is swept off her feet by a you know courageous man you understood and a woman likes that that is the aggression that the woman likes a woman doesn't like a coward man you know who is always afraid or you know who is you understood na you understood the point na so jayadev maharaj gives a whole lecture on what it means but he said that we will not do like this put a star and explain it and all that because he says where will it stop people will go on saying that this line is controversial this line is controversial whole proper books will be star and one explanation and the explanation also will be debated by many people so they said that we will not do any of it let the books remain as it is we need the culture of the devotees to spread the message exactly no you know putting star or an explanation so the kind of you know contribution that you know this at least these two people you know they are like the english editors of bbt is solid so they were they are talking about what they are doing so this is all in the bbt seminar so the next class just to see yeah hello is it's very surprising that uh, devotees who were there in ils had such doubts about the editors we try to understand you go across the world you know this one is different everywhere that's what i understood by staying there for 10 days so this is a very basic no no that is correct but the people who are asking questions they were not even like those sanyasis who are asking questions why are doing see because everybody comes from a different different background and everybody is facing different different challenges in different parts of the world i think what you know if you want to have a real you know understanding is going you should be something like prant sitan pro or pro travel all over is going and come back see he is not asking because he is very gravely sitting in the corner can you please enumerate us by your world tour then i'll pass the mic to garun bro there are like champions who have really gone all over the world and you know kind of seen things hum yaar pune mein baithe hain pooja samajhte nahi kuch hari bol hari bol it is same no problem no problem prabhu ji This seminar was given by Pravit to in Toronto as well. Mm-hmm. Literally, when you are out late and you do face encounter such situations where people from different faith will also try and approach you, like during my major master, and all they are publicly standing just at the gate. So, what is the matter? Yeah, what is the matter? They are distributing is called temple gate, and they are distributing magazine back to Prabhupada. So, it's not a you know odd or new thing in the Western world. It's very prevalent so it's very important for prabhuji and like pravit to to be open and like he gave more many more, more examples yeah. which may not have yeah i didn't say that. the whole ppt was there i didn't copy it so you remember that right like one you want to say something i mean yeah. you are just the point so all over the world is gone is different everywhere in different in this sense you know i mean there are different different challenges different different types of devotees different problems it's, it's a very different world actually everywhere yeah yeah Uh, there are some instances where Prabhupad has mentioned in the uh, video as well that editor should correct it. Like he gave one example of one uh, reading, which Tamal Krishna Maharaj was reading for Prabhupad, and Prabhupad immediately stopped him for a word. I forgot the word of the yeah, yeah. person, and Prabhupad said, "Rascal editors," and many times uh, because the word was translated wrongly. But sometimes the Rithvik people use that video to say that Prabhupada mentioned to these people. But it's not. They say we use the same video to justify what we are doing because there were mistakes that were done in the first part of edition. Like he said, uh, what was the name of the Hari Hari Prabhu? He was using the word the Blessed Lord said. So that was inspired from Radha Krishna's Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada's own terminology for Krishna was the supreme personality of Godhead. So even this change, these devotees made. Initial edition of Gita. 1985, supreme personality of Godhead has come in Bhagavad Gita. Till then it was blessed Lord said. <laughs> okay, I think we'll stop over here. Maybe some couple of questions. Thank you.
We say that Prabhupada books are like the main meal. We say the remaining books are like chutney, chapad, and that kind of thing. So here we see that these devotee devotees they are working so hard on papad and chutney. Means if we see from that perspective, that for all the devotees of Shiskon, main thing is Prabhupada books. So so when we work on so much books of other acharyas, so so I don't give him. We are distracted from the main Prabhupada books. Just one. I personally don't feel it that way. In fact, if you see, they have hardly got anything out. At this point, they have just five, six books out actually. There are so many books in the market, but they are not where they will be. If you see, I mean, if you have actually read books across different publishers, even among our Gaudiya Vaishnava, this thing, man, you can actually appreciate how the BBT books are much different from other books. Like you just take Brihad Bhagavata Vrati. If you see the book of Gobi Brandan Prabhu, BBD, which is edited by Jayadeva Swami and Keshav Bharati Maharaj, Dravida Prabhu, all these people. And if you see Brihad Bhagavata Vrati, somebody else, you'll get it in Bloy Bazaar. The yeah, difference is heaven and, you know, there's no comparison only. The, the work is class. And that, Jayadeva Maharaj was once asked, who can read such a book like Brihad Bhagavata Vrati? He said that anybody who believes in Krishna can read it. It's not some very high hondo book or anything. I mean, I'm not saying that one should read that book specifically. I mean, looking at it in another way, what I also, I mean, what I also want to say is that these Goswamis who have written all these books, they have written all these books for people like us only, no? Why did Ugo Goswami and uh, Sanatana Goswami write all this? For whom have they written? Now in that, there are some books which they wrote only for each other, remember? Which these people know. Gopivara Prabhu has marked all these things, among 500 books, which books, is, which priority Prabhupada wanted. Like for example, there is one book which Rupa Goswami wrote about, you know, separation of Radha and Krishna. Which he wrote to give as a gift to Raghunath and Gosu. So there are some books which were not for common people. And Raghunath and Goswami read and started crying so much that the disciples told Rupa Goswami that was thoda buttermilk bhe dhe ban kar diye. Rote hi rete after book padhi. So he wrote another book about Radha Krishna Milan to make him laugh. <laughs> oh, book like the out. Then he started laughing. Then he started taking prasad. Oh, buttermilk prasad. You understood? Huh? So some books they wrote for each other, which obviously was only for their class of people. You understand? It was not for others. But the bulk of it was not like that. If you see carefully, the bulk of it was very scholarly, and it and it clears many many doubts and you know many many. Many basic misconceptions and you know many things. It brings out devotional service very nicely actually. Of course, what we understand is that see the of course Prabhupada books certainly I mean for for us who are you know Prabhupada and Ugas, you know, we are grand disciples of Prabhupada and Prabhupada and Iskar. You know, for us that is extremely important because they keep us very much grounded. You understood, no? They keep us grounded in the Siddhanta, basically. So that is something is it. And Prabhupada has this wonderful flavor which is there, you know. Because every Acharya has his own mood which comes in his writings. So that is there. You know, so that is always there. So, I mean, see, any example, we cannot we cannot stretch an example too much. So it is that example is correct only. That example is given by all of us. That Prabhupada books are like the rice dal, sabji, you know, the basic meal. And everything is like papad chutney. But then if you extend it too much and say that, you know, 500 papads and chutneys, you know, for what? Not even required. Then that example loses its meaning. At, at, at a particular point, that example, you know, I mean, you understand what I'm saying, right? You can take an example beyond one point, basically. You know, so, of course, so they have their own order in terms of what is actually important for the devotees' understanding. And like, I, I'll give one simple example. So, I, I've just kind of started looking at this, the first Sandarbha of Jeeva Goswami. So, there, you know, Jeeva Goswami makes this point. He quotes from Shastra to establish how the Puranas are very much a part of the Vedic Dristi Mundi. Understood, na? The Vedic Shrutis. How the Puranas are integral to that. One whole chapter establishing the authenticity of Purana. Now, if you see the chapter, the way Jiva Goswami has written it, you know, I mean, I'm just summarizing in one line, but if, because it, it will require at least three, four times of reading to understand what they're saying. But still, the point is, 
that such topics which are there are extremely important even today when you talk to you know when iskon talks to scholars and many people who feel that puranas are later editions and puranas are you know kind of you know puranas don't have the same uh, authority or authenticity as the original vedas you understand people say this right for that he has written one chapter you understood so these things they have not addressed it at some paramahamsa level they have addressed it at a new world level problems they were so you understood so it's not that every book of theirs is very esoteric or you know very high fi it's not like that some are very much grounded for people to understand basic concepts like that so they have their use obviously we cannot say that you know that right and it's part of our culture and heritage why shouldn't we have it if you see it that way these people have written for us i mean going back to that same argument you see chaitanya mahaprabhu why did he tell the six goswamis to write books for whom for the generations of devotees who come later right that's why he told me Yeah, yeah, obviously, obviously, that is all understood only. There's no question all that. It's all understood. So not finished reading Bhagavatam. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense only going to read some other is commentary. You just so basic me ground nee na thamara. You have to be grounded properly. When you are grounded properly, then you can you know look up. If you are not on the ground only and you are floating somewhere, then you know you cannot look anywhere actually. I mean, that there is no question. That is taken for granted, right? So I think at least after reading the books of Prabhupada, then we can think of reading, or in between intermediate, you can read like you know recreation. <laughs> <laughs> in that also there are categories in terms of you know what can be read at what time, like that. So, so I think that should be with consultation. Uh, that requires some personal consultation. Any other point? Man and man. <laughs> okay. So, just for the question, so we just asked about it, why are devotees asking these kind of questions? Yeah. So, Prabhuji, so your, your, your question. He's answering your question. So, actually, one thing which I personally feel is that it's not necessarily bad if people are debating and questioning. Because, you know, they say that if, if everybody is thinking the same way, then nobody is thinking. So, if they're questioning things, actually, is good you know because it's coming out to debate with a different point of view to get a different perspective that's why yeah. i like this point because i'll tell you why because today dravida prabhu and jayadev maharaj are in good health and they are there to answer all this mm-hmm. after 50 years if somebody would ask these questions mm-hmm. there was no one to answer today because all these people have asked that's a positive way of looking at it which is again very important today because all these people have challenged them like anything they have like you know taken everything out and defended it But had these people not done so, that's how you see how they have served the mission. That's like how, for example, we see how the demons serve Krishna's leela. Where the leela is going on, the demon comes and does some nasty thing, and something beautiful comes out. That's our way of looking at it. That, but that's perfect. That view is also there. That's what you see. So that is one. And second thing is that you know, uh, if you are, when I was, I came to Iskon in Pune. You know, so I was very happy, you know, looking at Iskon in Pune. Then I went to different different cities in India. Yeah, okay. Then I went to abroad. Okay, and there are temples abroad where there is no Brahmachari in temple, not a single Brahmachari. So temple, temple is locked by the pujari when he is leaving, you know, for his daily activities. And they were, and even this uh, pujari is also Brahmasta. Okay, so he has got two sons who are eighteen year old. So he goes to you know pick them up, drop them, do something else as a occupation to earn some money. That time temple is either locked or the temple hall is open. Everything else is, else is locked. There is nobody in the temple. Okay. Then for the duties, not only duty worship, for cooking, for cleaning, restaurants come by rotation. Day time, evening time, <coughs> night time to take care of the temple. That's what is run. Okay. Then there are temples in India wherein people have got earlier motive for, for the whole temple management. Somebody is selling books to buy money to get money to get married. Is the brahmachari. Somebody is asking me. Come and join temple. You get enough food over here to eat. Okay, so there are a lot of people around in many different ways. Pune is a very, I would say, fortunate place to be in, and we don't even really realize all these things. And actually, in a way, it's good if you go and see these things because you realize what life is actually. So it's not so simple as we seem to be here over here. I think that's the reason people who are old enough they know so many things which we don't even realize about it. 
So, in fact, I appreciate many things which devotees were told, telling me earlier, but I couldn't really make sense out of it. But now it looks very easy, and because you know we also gain experience as we grow, right? And the more you meet other people outside this con circle or even different cities, different countries, you find there is some sort of churning happening within you also, right? So people have got different perspectives, and I think it's not really bad. I would say. A uh, poet is the one who uh, goes beyond all imagination. There is a saying in Marathi that Jaina Dekhe Ravi, Te Dekhe Kavi means one, the sun, he cannot say anything, but a poet he can see. So, uh, ordinarily, mundane poets, they do so many of the poetry. But in case of uh, Rupa Goswami, he has done he is poet of all poets. So, uh, the compositions you have explained, then the, definitely their meaning is out of this world. So my question is that, how do we understand that uh, this is not something, you know, uh, they have simply um, explored or um, elaborated uh, a concept or um, they are not, um, it is not something, you know, they have imagined means, uh, how do we understand uh, their mood? No, no, imagination is there in a poet. Without yeah, imagination, imagination, what kind of poet? Yeah, but then it is also based on the uh, fact. Means one way uh, to see all these Leela is like uh, Rupa Goswami, they are also taking part in uh, Leela of Radha and Krishna. And no, no. Yeah, okay. This is one way I am understanding, so is there any other way that uh, we can uh, see uh, Rupa Goswami's composition uh, more yeah. uh, understanding? Two things, of course, the kind of poetry that we saw today in that Rupa Goswami is de describing pastimes which are Bhagavad pastimes. You understood, no? Whether it is Malla or the Chora or the Dari or the, you know, they are all pastimes from the Bhagavatam. So they are all there. So in this he is describing pastimes which are already known, so to speak. But they have also composed pastimes which are not revealed in any of the books. You know? So from our perspective, from the Gaudiya Vaishnava perspective, we see it this way, because like Sanatana Goswami, when he writes Bhagavad Bhagavata Amrita, he says that I am going to tell you two stories which Parikshit told Uttara, you know, after Shukadeva Goswami left, there was a very brief time before Takshaka would come and bite. In those few hours, Parikshit narrated this entire book. And then he says that this is the book. Now somebody may say, how did Sanatan Goswami have access to what Parikshit said to Uttara? So, Jayadvit Maharaj was asked this question. He says, you can look at it in two ways. The way we look at it, when we say we, I am talking about a Gaudiya Vaishnava descendant. We look at Sanatan Goswami as an eternal genius of the spiritual world. So such eternal genius geniuses had the ability to access pastimes which have been lost in a different millennium and retrieve it for the benefit of mankind. That was their power. That's how the follower looks at it. That's how that's what Sanatan Goswami claims in his book. He says that, please, my dear readers, don't read my book as if it is fiction. It is true story, he says. So you've got to accept it that way. So that the follower takes it like that. You understood? He takes that story as the true story that actually happened, which was lost. But Sanatana accessed it and gave it to us. You understood? That's how we see it. But Jayadeva Swami said, but someone else outside the Gaudiya Vaishnava purview may not accept it. Like for example, you know, when the Brat Bhagavatam was out, they had given it to some scholars to give a forward. So, so they feel that Sanatana Goswami has composed a story in which he brings out the lessons of Vaishnavism. So Jayadeva Swami says, even if someone sees it like that, there is no harm. What is the problem with that? That means the Siddhanta is perfect. See, there are two things. One is the authenticity of the story in terms of whether it actually happened. Like, who somebody writes a story, you know, of the meeting of Krishna and Radha, something. One is the story, you know, whether the fact was true, whether like that actually it happened. Second thing is, is the Siddhanta right? 
Siddhant is always right. The Siddhant is perfectly in line with Gaudiya Vishnu philosophy in everything that is being said. So if, if somebody cannot take, doesn't have that much faith in Rupa and Janakan to feel that they had that capacity to access such past times, accept it like this. Take it that you know they have written a story which they themselves have kind of come up with, but it has perfect Siddhanta. So you learn the Siddhanta and apply it in your life. That is always there. You cannot escape that. Right? So you can see it in two ways. That's how you see it. But Jiva Goswami writes that the Vedic tradition is such that knowledge is always eternal and knowledge always keeps getting lost and Rishis always retrieve lost knowledge and present it to the audience. That is a function of a Rishi. Jeeva Goswami writes in his Tattva Sandarbha, in the first one, cha one chapter is dedicated again to that. To say, what is the function of a Rishi? It is to retrieve lost literature. And he says that how, you know, they have done this in the past. You see, that is why they would practice penance, tapasya, meditation to get this out. So they were given this ability to write, you know, where the Lord's, Lord would mysteriously, you know, guide them in writing a story. So, Sanatana Goswami, he says, how did I get this story? By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya's lotus feet, to whom I have surrendered. He has inspired me from within with his entire story. So you accept it literally that way, or if you find it too much to accept, accept the Siddhanta to be correct, because the Siddhanta is perfect. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You take it either way. But the Siddhanta way you cannot refute it. You you will be you will be perfect in line with God Vishnu Siddhanta. No, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, there are so many explanations. Or even there's a story of uh, this seedless mango. Yeah, so... Ha, no, no, no. Chaitanya Charitamrita, that is Chaitanya Bhagavad actually, by the way. But these stories are totally different. These stories are recorded by Murari Gupta, who was an eyewitness of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. For Chaitanya Bhagavad and Sarup Dhamadar Goswami's notes, which, which Raghunath Das Goswami had access to, about the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya in Jagannath Puri. No, this is of a different class totally, I'll tell you. Here, uh, there, there is no question that the, the story was true or not. Here, it was an eyewitness who records it. And Murari Gupta's writings were there for many centuries. Bhaktan Sarasthi says they got lost only recently. Murari Gupta's katachas or diaries were there for a long time. So was Sarudha Mother's diaries. They were lost for some time, but fortunately, Chaitanya Bhagavad and Chaitanya Charitamrita was written down by Vrindam Das, who had access to Murari Gupta's writings, and Krishna's Kaviraj, who had access to Sarudhamma's writings through Raghunath Das Goswami. You understood, no? So they wrote it. So that's a totally different thing. That's different. We are talking here about stories which Rupa and Sanatana have not even, from an external perspective, seen or present. We are writing about something which I took in 5,000 years ago. Which is not there in the Bhagavad. So there is a difference between the two. Correct, right, na? Something similar to go in the Vashavari and Lord Krishna. Yeah, yeah. Even materially, if you see it happens, like for example, this this lady is there, Shakuntala Devi in India, who is that mathematician. She can multiply any two big numbers. And if you ask her how she does it, she says, I am just inspired by a person to give the answer. I am not even calculating it. You see her interview, that's what she says. Two big, big numbers you give, tell her to multiply, she says the answer. Yeah. She says, I am not multiplying it. We multiply nahi kar rahe I am inspired to say the answer. And the answer is right. <laughs> it's a medical talent. Galileo, this fellow, you know, this Mozart, you know, who composes various, you know, he says that all these tunes just would flood in my mind. That's karma of a person, material karma. Where he's just flooded with thought. That's what, if you if you see Sadakot Prabhu, you should read a book where he talks about what is inspiration. Classic, he gives such amazing examples. Ekkevad, ekkevad example. We'll talk about it sometime. 
so many examples he quotes on how different different people and different spheres have been materially inspired by Vidhi. Where without doing any real work, like I will tell you, this Ramanujan is there of Max. This fellow, 100 years back when he passed away, he wrote down formula which intuitively said these have to be correct. But to prove those, there were other theorems which were not even proved at that time. Are you understanding? But he said that no, intuitively I am very confident that this is correct. How I don't know. Future mathematicians will prove this statement. And all that have been proved to be correct. So I am saying that by material good karma, if a person can be inspired like that, here we are talking about liberated souls, Baba. We are talking about people who are, you know, Rupa and Sanatana are lots of, you know, I mean, they are like Mahaprabhu's personal. Mahaprabhu embraces Rupa and Sanatana and, you know, calls them their sons. They are of a different class. I mean, we are talking about, yeah, Manjari, that's why we started with Sri Rupa Manjari Pada. They are a different class altogether. Spiritually, materially also they were genius only. Maha genius they were. Materially, they were question of that. I mean, see, they were politicians. Gaurang Prabhu he says, oh, sorry, Gaurang Prabhu he says that you know, Rupa goes, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu got you know, Rupa, Sanatan, Raghunadas, who are all politicians. Means they were like you know, the Prime Minister and Home Minister of the Nawab Hussain Shah was controlling entire Bengal, which is Bengal and Bangladesh of today. At the age of 25. Please remember, at 25 they were Prime Minister, Home Minister of Bengal. And the king looked upon them for advice. He knew there is no one as brilliant as the material, managerial. So they had, they were multifaceted personalities. So, so we have to see all that and then understand what their contributions. Correct? Sira Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhakti Pradhi ki jai. Nidhara Varmanande.